includes leadership positions at Cobrio, which is Colorado's Health Information Exchange Organization. He's also had leadership positions in correctional care and insurance organizations. In addition, he founded the Rocky Mountain Youth Clinics, which is a large safety net clinic in Colorado. We're very honored to have Dr. Wilk attend Grand Rounds, and he's done so for the past several years every fall, giving us kind of a state of the state of public health. So. Sixty-three. No. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't that? Good. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for having me. I actually always look forward to um, kind of coming and um, hearing from all of you and being challenged uh, as I give this talk. So please um, feel free to ask questions as we go along. I kind of always think about like what would be the most interesting things to talk about because. The state of health is, is so broad, and there's so many different things going on at any given time, uh, that this is really just to kind of lay some things out to maybe stimulate some thought, answer some questions about things that are emerging or, or more relevant uh, of late. Uh, but I want to make sure you all get what you want to get out of this, too. So I'll definitely uh, save some time for questions at the end um, besides. So... Um, a couple of things, uh, just for context, I thought I'd start with kind of how we kind of develop uh, what our approach or attack is when it comes to public and environmental health in the state. And um, years ago, uh, we had the Public Health Act um, sort of passed uh, here uh, in Colorado. And that sort of helped sort of create some requirements, some statutory requirements about how the state has to sort of um, be involved when it comes to planning and even funding um, public health throughout the state. Um, probably a little heavier on the planning part and not so heavy on the funding part, uh, as you'll see. Uh, but this will just help give you a little bit of context. And so we have um, a five-year plan that we develop uh, every five years. And so you can see we're in the, the middle of this, uh, this round of the five-year plan. And, and I put um, all of the reference uh, websites on here, too. So you can always go to our website. Uh, and uh, if you're having trouble sleeping at night and you want to dive into the entire plan and uh, take a look at it, um, it's called Shaping a State of Health, uh, and uh, this really serves as kind of our guide, our, our primary guide, uh, as uh, we go through public health. Uh, I'm going to go through each spoke individually. No, I'm not. Um, each spoke actually represents a different county uh, in and around Colorado. How many counties do we have in Colorado? 64, is that what you said? Yeah, 64, right. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, and how many then public health, local public health agencies do we have that serve those 64 counties? 56, 57? Yeah, it's close enough. 53. So, uh, because uh, some of them, you know, you'll see in a minute, kind of come together in different ways, shapes, and forms. So it's not necessarily one for every county. But... What we try to do um, is start with the federal government, uh, which for us is uh, primarily the CDC and HRSA. And from there, uh, we took our 10 winnable battles a few years ago. And from there, we sort of passed that on as a menu to all of the local public health agencies to say, OK, so here's kind of this menu. Um, let's um, all sort of figure out what's a priority for each of our local entities. And then that way there, you have some local control about what might be 
a public health priority or what you've set as a public health priority for your particular county, uh, but there is some conformity as it relates to kind of the 10 choices um, that you get. And so by and large, we put out there unintended pregnancy, tobacco, safe food, oral health, obesity, substance abuse, and mental health, which are either taken together or apart, uh, injury prevention, infectious disease prevention, clean air, and clean water. And so um, uh, as we go through this, I'll show you sort of how uh, many of these local public health agencies have kind of lined up with what we consider our flagship priorities. So this is the map today. Um, you know, uh, I had a slide on here uh, of a map from 10, 15 years ago that showed not much activity when it comes to local public health. But this is just to give you an idea that it's not one size fits all, that we have seven different local public health structures. There are single county agencies, and I'm partially colorblind, so if I call something light blue but it's really pink or purple, just forgive me. But single county agency looks kind of light blue. I don't know what color that is, or gray. Um, uh, district local public health agency where a couple of neighboring sort of counties have come together a contractual arrangement with another county to provide services in my county, uh, health and human services with a separate public health director, health and human services directed by a human service director, uh, the majority of public health services actually delegated to a local nonprofit or two coordinating local public health agencies. So you could see, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all, and it just depends you know, what works best um, for each of uh, those uh, different areas. Um, the other cool part from a quality standpoint is there are now five local public health agencies around the state, as well as our own state health department, that are FAB accredited. Uh, public Health Accreditation Board is sort of our accrediting body for those who are accustomed to accreditations, uh, whether it's for hospitals or, or what have you. So again, this is just a, a reiteration and in, in how this map sort of lights up depending uh, and again, you can go to our website, and it actually does light up, and you can click on uh, a particular county of interest, or you can go through uh, these flagship priorities and say, hey, which county has sort of picked clean air or clean water uh, or you know, on down the list, uh, and vice versa. Um, the other interesting part when you look at local public health agencies is um, – you can see on these bottom two, there's nine local public health agencies of those 53 or so that I talked about that actually represent 85% of the state's population. So, but the majority of local public health agencies serve counties that have very small populations. And so you know, we, we have this sort of balancing act of trying to deal with all of these different local public health agencies, but... Um, there's only a handful that really, you know, predominate when it comes to the, the bulk of the population um, here in the state. So let's talk a little bit about budget. Um, so Colorado's annual overall budget is somewhere around $27 billion. Um, and uh, the majority of our budget, you can see, is, is split up uh, almost in thirds between uh, general fund, um, cash, um, and then um, federal funding with a small amount um, that's um, reappropriated funds. And so your first I'm going to ask you a little test questions along the way, so don't be afraid to just shout them out or I'm going to pick on especially people in the back row. Um, uh, but uh, so $27 billion for the overall state budget – how much marijuana tax revenue do we generate in a year? $20 billion. $20 billion? $20 What? $20 million. $20 million? $20 million? All right, somewhere between $20 billion and $20 million. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a wide range. So it's over a billion? No, it's actually it's about $200 million. So I like to sort of, you know, mention that in the context of the overall state budget because a lot of people will say, oh, marijuana money, it's driving Colorado's state budget and other states need to legalize marijuana and get taxes because that's really a big part of what our state tax structure and our, our budget is, is made from. Uh, any mathematicians? 200 million of 27 billion is about what? Like less than a percent? Am I something right? Okay. No, check me seriously. <coughs> one time I said 10 percent, and someone went, "No, no, no, that's not." That's not, that's not, that's not. No, so it's, yeah, it's less than one percent. So it's significant money, 
And we use that money actually for all of our education activities, our surveillance activities, our enforcement activities, everything related to marijuana and then some, not to mention school funding uh, when it comes to construction projects. But you can see in the context of the $27 billion that our state budget is, it's not driving the state budget. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you look at the five largest funded um, departments in the state, Healthcare policy and finance, which is in essence Medicaid, uh, is actually the largest um, uh, of the, the budgets at $9 billion. Education, $5.4 billion. Higher ed, $4 billion. Human services, almost $2 billion. Transportation, $1.5 billion. So those five agencies come together to form about 80% of the total state budget. We in public health are amongst the 17 remaining entities that split the remaining $5.3 billion uh, when you look at um, state funding. We're also one of only six states in the country that combine both public health and environmental health. Most states actually have separate entities um, for public health and environmental health. Some states have combined entities for public health and Medicaid and or human services. So every state is set up a little bit differently. Um, but I like the fact that we actually have a combined um, uh, uh, department of both public and environmental health. Uh, a significant portion of our budget, though, is environment related. Um, and then most of the environmental work we actually retain at the state level. So whereas we delegate out to all those entities the majority of the public health work, we retain a lot of the environmental health work uh, because of um, different requirements. I mentioned earlier on the federal side, CDC and HRSA are the predominant funders on public health. Uh, and then we have a number of state funds uh, that we um, uh, get some money from uh, the general fund as well as um, cash through tobacco settlement and then that mar marijuana money like we talked about. Uh, we do accept private funding. So if anybody's so compelled by this talk afterward and you want to write me a check, um, I'm not allowed to solicit for that funding, but um, you could just make it out to my name, and I, I'll trust me, I'll put it into the... Uh, we, it's mostly foundation money uh, when we say private funding, so we have, we're lucky enough in Colorado that we have a number of large um, uh, trusts or foundations um, that um, actually help fund, uh, and we collaboratively fund a, a number of different initiatives. Um, so now this is our budget, uh, and you can see the majority of our budget actually is federal funds, uh, followed by cash funds, again, uh, how we uh, generate that cash either through permits or inspections or people coming to get birth certificates or death certificates or marijuana cash. Uh, and then um, a very small portion of what we get is actually state general fund. So when you hear about politics occurring down at the state house, um, that doesn't impact us as much in public health uh, as when you hear about politics at the federal level. Uh, and with the change in administration since November, uh, we'll come to that at the end uh, and, and talk about some of the challenges there. But that's where we're most vulnerable is as it relates to federal funding, as you can see um, by the pie here. Um, and then local uh, at the local level, um, you know, again, we push a lot of the money out to the local public health agencies, and they do have some requirements uh, where they do have to keep that money specific to public health. They have to have a treasurer. And then there's a formula where local public health gets what's called a per capita. So based on the number of people that live in that county or that particular catchment area, um, they, they're required at least to get a dollar fifty per person to fund local public health. Now, local governments can expand that and actually allow for more money to come into local public health. But unfortunately, some of them retain it at $1.50. The average you can see is about 20 bucks, and some really public health friendly communities or counties actually fund it at 80 bucks. But as you can imagine, that's probably you know, very rural, sparsely populated areas where you have to have some level of infrastructure in order to be able to do some level um, of, um, of public uh, health. So this is how the pie sort of shapes up for local public health budgets. Uh, and the majority of their funding comes from us, meaning the state. But really, half of the money that we're pushing through to them is, is uh, a federal funded source. So um, they get a lot more money from their local governments, uh, like I said. 
And then some of them are doing patient care services, so they're getting insurance fees and, and things like that for providing care. So that's enough of the context. Now I'll give you some context for how we size up uh, demographically uh, as a state. So this is first uh, by age and gender. So you can see we're pretty equal when it comes to males and females. And um, we're also uh, pretty equally distributed um, across the age spectrum. Uh, th this will continue to move toward um, the older ages, uh, like Lisa uh, and such. But um, <laughs> you know, um, you're gonna have to move soon. So, that we, um, are you? No. Uh, so anyway, uh, but the good news is, I mean, or bad news, depending on how you look at it, is you know we have a lot of young people coming into the state, and so it's kind of keeping us um, fairly well balanced when it comes to um, how we approach things um, from from a demographic standpoint. Um, I got to go a couple of months ago to Taiwan um, for a, a public health um, uh, symposium trip. And um, it's interesting because their population is aging, but they're not necessarily sort of repopulating. So they don't focus on unintended pregnancy. They're paying people to actually get pregnant uh, at any age because they're worried that nobody's going to be there to take care of uh, their elderly population uh, as it continues to kind of age out. So anyway, um, not a problem for us here. And as many of you know, um, uh, our sort of um, uh, racial and ethnic uh, demographic trend is toward uh, continuing to see a higher percentage of uh, Latinos uh, and a, a lessening percentage uh, of white uh, or Caucasian. Um, one of the things, actually, is I put that up that, you know, we like to make sure that we sort of thread through <laughs> everything we do at the health department is a focus on health equity. That just because sort of at the top level, it might look like we're healthy, we like to sort of peel that top layer of the onion back and say, okay, well, uh, obesity, when we get to obesity, for example, we may be the leanest state. But when you peel that top uh, layer of the onion back, you see that our Latino population is not amongst the leanest across the country. And so almost with every project or with every um, initiative that we're involved in, we try to sort of take it down a couple of levels to make sure that we're not masking or missing a disparity uh, or something that may be specific to um, um, you know, a, a particular racial or ethnic group. If you look at um, uh, infant mortality, for example, um, we actually have an improving number as it relates to infant mortality here in the state. But then when you sort of peel back the layers and you look at it by race, uh, African-American infant mortality still is unacceptably high, quite a bit higher uh, than any of the other uh, racial or ethnic uh, groups uh, here in the state. So that allows us to be more targeted and focused uh, in our approach rather than saying, oh, we don't have a problem and, and not addressing it at all. So um, going down the list of kind of accomplishments and, and challenges, again, I, I'll point you all back to the five-year plan. Uh, and we slice and dice this sort of along a continuum so that you can um, take a look. And, and um, again, if you're having trouble sleeping or if you're interested, go to our website because um, uh, we have some pretty talented folks at the department who've done a really good job of not only putting this together, but then um, uh, using Tableau so that then we can represent uh, a lot of these facts and figures in a very uh, reader-friendly way. So. Um, so I talked about obesity. So on the good news side, uh, we've actually seen a decrease uh, in childhood obesity. Um, we didn't think we were seeing a decrease at first, but then we started to break it down by age groups. And um, uh, we have some particular age groups um, where we are seeing, and we are seeing that we're making some progress as it relates to reducing um, the prevalence of obesity. Uh, on the bad news side, we're seeing an increase in adult obesity. Uh, Colorado has always been known as the leanest state. Uh, and the good news is we are still the leanest state but everybody's getting fatter. So, you know, we're just kind of less fat than everybody else, but unfortunately, you know, we're, we're losing some ground there, as you can see um, on the bottom graph. And like I said before, there's some disparities there that, um, you know, we need to address and not just be sort of a one-size-doesn't-fit-all. 
Um, and the other thing um, that uh, we've been doing over the past few years is really uh, a focused effort uh, on the social determinants of health, especially as it relates to obesity. You know, Colorado is unique. We've got such a, a wonderful uh, outdoor culture and outdoor environment. Our governor is a big advocate, of course, for cycling and trail infrastructure, and so really trying to sort of push more in that direction. We're actually going to um, award two state-of-the-art fitness centers um, to uh, three different schools through a private uh, funder uh, this week, and to try and sort of really pick up on the two sides of this equation, on the nutrition side, but also on the activity side, and see what we can do to address this. Um, and then we have a lot of uh, what I say like leading the example type programs. Um, uh, the National Diabetes Prevention Program is an evidence-based program where we identify folks who are at risk for diabetes. Our own Medicaid program wasn't even covering this um, initially, so now we've got Medicaid sort of more involved in trying to get more commercial insurers, including state employees, to engage and be a part of this program. Um, hospitals um, and universities, such as here maybe, um, you know, you look in the vending machines, you look in the cafeterias, uh, hospitals, you see the food that they're serving to patients. Not very good examples of trying to sort of address good nutrition. And so we've developed um, and are participating in a healthy hospital compact program where hospitals sign up uh, and can achieve different levels from bronze all the way up to platinum where they can offer healthy um, food and beverage alternatives, whether it's through the vending or through the, for the patients or for the visitors. Same thing with baby-friendly hospitals. It's another accreditation for hospitals. Um, for those who had babies or maybe have rotated through hospitals and the nurseries, you know, we used to always send home uh, new moms and new parents with um, uh, formula sample packs. And so it, it acted in a way to almost disincentivize uh, any uh, breastfeeding efforts. And so now as part of kind of the baby-friendly accreditation, we no longer uh, have the hospital sending home those packs, but do significantly more teaching and support and guidance as it relates uh, to breastfeeding because babies who are breastfed are less likely to become obese. Children who are... Um, obese are more likely to become obese adolescents and adults. So if we can sort of address this early on, and we are seeing that we're making some progress there, then uh, the next generation of adults hopefully will still be the leanest, but will actually truly be the leanest state and not the least fat state. So um, Substance use uh, hits the headlines quite a bit. It's become very uh, politically in uh, on both sides of the aisle to see who can address this in a more meaningful way. Um, Colorado had, a few years ago, one of the worst um, misuse of prescription uh, opiate rates of any state in the country. We were either second or third worst. And at the time, then, the governor put into uh, play um, this consortium that's actually based here at the school, at the School of Pharmacy, to address opioid uh, misuse. And so we've seen some improvement now. And, and the reason why this is so important is it's not just as it relates to the abuse of prescriptive opiates, but we did a survey amongst heroin users that we released very recently. And um, heroin users, like 70% of heroin users said they got to heroin by way of prescriptive opiates. So prescriptive opiates are not just a problem in of themselves, but again, are truly a gateway to elicit um, heroin uh, and uh, illicit opiate um, uh, use. So uh, there's a lot of different ways uh, that uh, we're working with the consortium uh, to skin this cat. Uh, the first is we want to prevent death uh, more than anything. So we want to make naloxone or Narcan available uh, to treat somebody um, who may be experiencing an overdose. So a few years ago, we helped put legislation um, through. And so under my license um, and whoever my successors will be, uh, you can get Narcan. Anybody can go to a pharmacy, and there's a standing order so that you can get Narcan or Naloxone. If you're a first responder, if you're a family member, it doesn't matter. You can just walk up and get it as, as if it were over the counter. Doesn't necessarily mean insurance is going to cover it. Doesn't necessarily mean that the drug makers are going to 
not increase the price because they see an opportunity, but at least we've removed one barrier to address the death part. Um, the other thing is just this excess of prescriptive opiates, whether it's on the prescriber side. So we're working with um, prescribers on the prescription drug monitoring program. Uh, we're also working to set up in every county in the state a disposal site, a safe disposal site, so that anybody can bring their excess drugs uh, and safely have them disposed so they don't impact the environment or impact um, other people. So we've seen a nice increase there, and uh, that should get to 100% this year because we only have a few counties left uh, that we haven't set up the disposal sites. Um, anybody want to hazard a guess how many opiate deaths we have in the state a year? Combined, prescriptive and heroin? 1,000. All right, 500. So you're a pessimist, but it's all right. <laughs> We're not there yet, but, um, you know, uh, it's 300-ish uh, on the prescriptive side and 200-ish on, um, on the heroin side. And so, uh, unfortunately, you know, it may get to 1,000, and it may already be 1,000 because we're two years behind in actually having, you know, the data uh, for the current year. So you, you could be right on, unfortunately, for, for this particular year. So um, I think, you know, there's a lot of different ways. Uh, like I said, we were asked, and actually I have to call this guy back, um, uh, saying, like, what's the single best or most effective way to address this problem. And, and there really is no single best or most effective way because the other thing we have to do is have more medication-assisted treatment um, because we don't have enough, especially in rural areas, resources for folks who do become addicted to actually get evidence-based treatment, which is medication-assisted treatment. Um, as you can see, I mean, you know, motor vehicle deaths had been moving in the right direction. That's um, the darker, maybe it's red or brown line that's kind of coming down. What are you saying, Lisa, red? Red. Okay, thank you. Uh, so red, you know, coming down. Um, but, um, you know, we're, we're going to continue to watch that because of all the attention on impaired driving, whether it's through drugs, through alcohol, through marijuana, or through um, cell phones. Um, so, uh, but the good news is it's holding steady. Unfortunately, uh, again, the, the total drug poisoning and overdose line continues to go up, and you can see it's being driven by both prescriptive uh, drug misuse as well as heroin. All right, so I'll switch gears to tobacco. We have some good news, at least on the traditional uh, definition of tobacco use, that being smoking. And um, so percent of high school students who are current smokers, um, you know, has decreased uh, over the years. The problem is we're seeing kind of an explosive increase in vaping, uh, and we don't yet have a handle on that. Those questions have only recently been added, and so... Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how much shift amongst our youth have occurred uh, as a result of um, uh, poor and adequate uh, regulations uh, on vaping. Um, single most effective evidence-based program to reduce smoking amongst a population is? Taxes. Taxes, yes. True Democrat. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, money. Uh, you know, make them less affordable, unaffordable. It's really, um, you know, again, the, the strongest uh, evidence-based uh, program you can put in place. And unfortunately, uh, we had a ballot initiative uh, last November that failed, uh, not because people didn't think cigarettes should cost more and that would be an effective way to reduce um, smoking, but... Uh, a bunch of folks got behind it uh, to say we're growing government because we would have collected $300 million in taxes, and God forbid that should go to public health or to preventing mental health issues or treating mental health issues. So we, got, we lost. So, um, and, you know, on the good news side, you know, cigarette sales have continued to decline, but they've leveled off, and now we're worried that they're going to start going up again because if you look, we have one of the lower tax rates um, here in Colorado uh, as compared uh, to other states and municipalities. Um, uh, the interesting part on this, too, is there's a little bit of a nuance where if a municipality wants to raise tobacco taxes, 
they could become ineligible to receive tobacco settlement money. And so we, we've, we've had a little bit of an issue in trying to sort of work with municipalities and communities about how to sort of use cost as a deterrent. Uh, and we're finding uh, little ways around it and little loopholes around it. But um, uh, be aware uh, that there, there is this little bit of um, uh, nuance that we might have to get cleared up through the legislature at some point. Uh, oral health, um, actually doing pretty well. Uh, we have met targets since 2013 for getting the youngest uh, of our kids uh, in to see a dentist, those who are at risk. Um, and then still about three quarters of Coloradans are served by public water systems with appropriate fluoridation, but fluoridation, like some other evidence-based programs like O immunizations, uh, are under attack uh, by folks who uh, uh, kind of like to refuse or ignore science. And so uh, one of the things we can all do is continue to be advocates for science and certainly advocates for fluoridation. Uh, the entire community of Durango almost uh, took away fluoridation. I had to go down there myself and, and meet with uh, the town council folks uh, to make sure that that wasn't going to happen, and it hasn't. But it doesn't mean we don't continually get challenged um, uh, by that. Hey, a uh, big success story, uh, our decline in uh, teen birth rate. Um, uh, in 2008, we were amongst one of the worst uh, in the country when it came to birth rate amongst teens 15 to 19, and that's dropped by more than 60%. And the good news on this is that it's not just the birth rate uh, itself, but um, it's also the rate of abortion. So. Now you have sort of this bipartisan health argument that says, hey, unintended pregnancy is unintended pregnancy, whether it results in birth or abortion. And um, that was um, largely attributed to uh, our long-acting reversible contraceptive program, uh, otherwise known as LARC, uh, which is IUDs and then also implantable long-acting um, hormonal contraceptives. And uh, we've really become a, a model for other states to follow. Th this was, in fact, as a result of $25 million in private money that came in so that we could try this as an experiment. And, and, and wow, worked out really well. So uh, luckily now we have general fund. I am. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Every time I talk about birth control. <laughs> I just got to move on. Okay. Uh, water uh, is interesting. I mean, water, of course, is uh, uh, quite a hot topic here in Colorado because uh, we need to uh, conserve water. Uh, we're also a headwater state, so that means a lot of other states rely on Colorado for their water downstream of us. Uh, but we at the health department are about water quality more so than the conservation piece. It doesn't mean that we're not, you know, pro-conservation. Of course we are. Uh, but, uh, you know, this, this is really uh, our role. The interesting part is, you know, we had gone, we had this really nice long winning streak of no uh, waterborne disease outbreaks uh, in uh, public drinking water systems uh, for, for several years. And then because of this weird um, climate change, oh, did I say climate change? Uh, <laughs> uh, because of our changing uh, weather this past summer, uh, where we had, you know, some rain, you know, for like a week at a time, and then it was just drought-like for a couple of weeks at a time. Uh, those, those are very conducive conditions for uh, E. coli to sort of pop up because when you're pulling from these reservoirs, if you don't have the right system in place, um, then uh, it certainly puts us more at risk. So it's something that we're working on, and we have to make sure we have the right infrastructure um, to continue to address that. Uh, well, if water was controversial, then air is right past it. Um, you know, we've got a, a lot going on as it relates to air. Uh, I always try to tell people, and I always make sure that people understand when you're talking about air pollution, make sure the first branch point you think of is, you know, are we talking about true pollutants that act as respiratory irritants, or are we talking about greenhouse gases that could contribute to climate change? Uh, and it really helps to make sure that you understand, and we understand, and I understand, 
the difference because when you're talking about methane and oil and gas operations or you're talking about CO2 when it comes to power plants and coal-fired versus clean energy, or you're talking about ground level ozone, which is nothing like the ozone that we were burning a hole in because of our deodorant and, and, and hairspray cans in my generation when we were growing up. Um, it, you know, it, you just have to sort of make sure that uh, you, you understand and recognize um, the importance of controlling all of that um, because uh, um, people will try to trip you up and say, you know, well, you're really not helping, you know, uh, reduce uh, irritation for folks who are suffering from asthma, or you're really not, you know, really talking about something that could contribute to climate change. So the good news is, as a state here in Colorado, we are very much aware of all of these different um, emissions. Uh, and um, unfortunately, the front range, uh, because of where we sit um, topographically, geographically, because of where we sit, um, you know, we're, we're, we're a, uh, an area of non-attainment of uh, standard as it relates to ozone in particular, uh, ground level ozone, which uh, can be a direct irritant. Um, and so uh, we just have to work a little bit harder. Now, we have a lot of reasons why our ozone uh, level is higher. Um, anybody know what kind of contributes to naturally occurring ground level ozone? especially things that we have in abundance here in Colorado. I'm thinking of three things. Not today so much. Radon? Sunlight. Who said radon? No. <laughs> not radon. Sunlight? See, now he's not going to answer anymore. because yeah. <laughs> Temperature inversions? Uh, snow. So sunlight, snow, and altitude. Uh, those are the three things that actually contribute to a higher sort of um, background ozone level. So when, when we're asked to sort of get our ozone down to a level of 75, let alone a level of 70, we're already starting at like a naturally occurring level of about 55, where many states back east are starting at, you know, background levels maybe in the 20s. So, yeah, and it's not an excuse. We can't, you know, uh, you know ozone is ozone, and, and it's an irritant, um, and there's issues. And Lee's nodding his head, so I'm glad. Uh, but, you know, we, we have to make sure that we address it, and, you know, so it's an explanation. It's not an excuse. We don't just get to go, well, we have higher background levels, so we should allow for ozone levels, you know, in the 90s or over 100. Uh, no, it's just we have, you know, unique circumstances that we have to try to address when it comes to then those man-made levels like auto emissions, oil and gas operations, um, whatever the case may be. All right, so I'm going to move it along a little bit here too. So uh, cancer, you know, I, I like to, you know, um, sort of reference our registries quite a bit because... Uh, going again back to the environmental stuff, people like to sort of say, well, with all the oil and gas stuff, we must have a higher incidence of certain types of cancers in Weld County because they have so many different oil and gas operations, or Garfield County. Uh, we had a scare where we thought there was a, a higher uh, incidence of birth defects in Garfield County. Uh, and so immediately people started jumping to, well, higher birth defects, more oil and gas operations, that must be the cause. Well, uh, it wasn't the cause. Uh, in, in fact, there wasn't even a higher incidence of birth defects uh, in Garfield County. Uh, there was a particular radiologist that was overreading prenatal ultrasounds uh, that then um, they read them during prenatal period as having birth defects, but then the mothers would deliver perfectly healthy babies. And so through our own sort of cluster investigation and analysis, we were able to determine that um, everything was okay. But we like to come back to sort of, you know, our overall surveillance. You know, we do surveillance by county and by geographic areas. We do it through birth defects registry. We do it through cancer registry. And so you could see we haven't seen much of any kind of increase as it relates to the invasive cancers. Um, you know, uh, given our age demographic, it shouldn't be too surprising that breast uh, and prostate uh, are amongst the highest. Um, but um, again, you know, when you break this down even uh, at a county-specific uh, level or through sort of smaller geographic areas, 
you don't see anything, any cause for concern as it relates to environmental background. Um, another thing that people forget about um, is the role that insurance coverage uh, and the expansion of insurance coverage has paid uh, in saving lives and being a public health priority. So this was a study that was done actually a year ago uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, published a year ago, July. And it's a model that basically says for you know, uh, every 100,000 people for which um, insurance uh, expansion was available, 19.6 deaths were averted. So when you model this uh, for Colorado and where the expansions occurred, we averted 629 deaths. So that's as many people who die from breast and colon cancer combined. And it's also more at least the old number, uh, more deaths averted than uh, those who had overdose uh, from prescriptive uh, and illicit opiates. So we shouldn't um, underestimate the importance, not just from a medical coverage standpoint that uh, Medicaid expansion and the Affordable Care Act have had, but also from a, a life-saving um, standpoint uh, with regard to the number of lives that have been saved. Um, and, and so, you know, we try to keep up with that because through uh, our department, we also have the primary care office where we're um, trying to place um, not just primary care physicians, but all levels of health care providers into underserved communities um, throughout the state. And, um, you know, this is uh, most recent data to show where we're still kind of underclubbed when it comes to just primary care physicians alone. And so on a percentage basis, Clear Creek, Gilpin, Park, Teller, you know, are really um, the farthest away on a percentage basis. But if we got nine and a half more physicians in that community, we'd be at the 3,500 people to one physician or practitioner. Uh, that's the benchmark. Uh, but then you go down to some place like, you know, El Paso. So on a percentage basis, it's a little bit better. But we, we're still 61 practitioners short in El Paso County. Uh, and so this is how we sort of prioritize when we get applicants who want to practice in these particular areas of the state um, based on, you know, where, where the greatest needs are. And I point to overall for anybody who's thinking about doing public health and primary care together, like I did, we're still about 210 practitioners short. So um, lots of opportunity for you all around the state, including Denver. I mean, Denver's still 19 and a half providers short um, as of this year. Um, and so it's not just about placing practitioners and staff, but then uh, integrating primary care and behavioral health care. Uh, and this is a public health priority. I mean, it, it applies to the health care system. But, um, you know, we, we need to sort of stop siloing medical care from behavioral health and substance abuse care. The patient walks in for treatment or for care or to be evaluated. They should be able to get their entire body and mind evaluated. Um, and so uh, we've sunk about $65 million of federal money, along with uh, quite, quite a bit of state money, into trying to get primary care practices now integrated so that it's both medical care and behavioral health or, or primary care. So we're up to about a third of all practices in the state. And one of the biggest um, uh, unfortunates um, for us to try and get addressed, and what, have I, what I've said is, you know, if we can't move the needle on this, which is our rate of suicide, then I'm not sure that integration uh, is the right way um, to go. Uh, because it's possible that people just aren't even seeking um, traditional health care services as a means uh, to have their mental health issues addressed. And we have to think outside of the box um, and look for other opportunities, which we've been doing. So if you look at this, this is just um, uh, unfortunately um, not dissimilar from other Western states. The Western states, uh, these the Rocky Mountain West states, have uh, some of the highest rates of suicide in the country. Um, in particular, uh, middle-aged men, uh, I'll say young men now, uh, 45 to 54, uh, but, you know, that, that, that middle age uh, for men and then teenagers. Um, and so we're, we're sort of top 10 uh, for both of those. And so we're doing a, a lot of, uh, I say, innovation to see if we can try and, again, 
um, appeal to these particular groups, not to mention just kind of across the board. So um, uh, one thing uh, we have is uh, man therapy. How many of you have seen or heard of man therapy? Yeah? Okay, enough of you. All right. So, you know, it's a website that we've created, and, and if you watch the Rockies on TV, I've been uh, very impressed that we've been running our commercials during the Rockies games because there's probably a lot of young men like me who sit on the couch and watch the Rockies games who then, you know, say, what, what is this man therapy thing about? And so we try and use humor as a way, uh, what's the guy's name? Not Ron. I always mix it up because it's Ron Burgundy was the guy from, um, uh, what was the movie? Rich Mahogany. Yeah, so it's Rich Mahogany. Thank you. Uh, so Rich Mahogany is our guy. Um, and, you know, he's offensive. I mean, uh, I think it, it is offensive to women. Um, and I think, um, you know, uh, it, it's tough to watch sometimes and think, gosh, this was like the government, like the health department was involved in making this horribly offensive video. But we have to try and do something, and we have to try and, and, and do some things differently. Um, the other program uh, which uh, we're gaining some momentum on is our gun shop program. Uh, and the gun shop program is taking advantage of um, the, the sad reality that uh, guns are available and they're legal. And uh, it's tough uh, to talk about it given the events of last night. Uh, but uh, what we always quote, uh, uh, which uh, is true for Colorado and many of the western states, is guns are implicated eight times more often in suicide than they are in acts of violence. So as horrific as many of these large-scale um, acts of violence are, um, we just have to remember that guns are implicated many, 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 many more times in suicide than they are in these kind of events. And so uh, when people come in and buy a gun, uh, it's not just about background check and about gun safety, but we're now introducing and getting cooperation from gun shop owners to help us do screening and help us do referral for folks who may be at risk um, for using those guns uh, on themselves. And we have uh, gun range owners, so where people actually go and fire these things, um, involved in the project as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a big area. It's a big unmet need, of course. And so, um, you know, um, uh, integrated behavioral health uh, and primary care is only one piece of it. We really have to, again, be more community-focused uh, and try and be more opportunistic when it comes to something like this. So I'll wrap up, and then we'll take some questions. But... Um, the fun and interesting and challenging um, and daunting and pessimistic and optimistic parts of the job are that you always have some emerging issue uh, coming your way uh, that you have to try and sort of figure out what's in the best interest of public and environmental health. And certainly have had our fair share. Um, I started the day of the flood. I always tell people I started five days earlier, as Lisa probably remembers, because I was supposed to start on Monday, but I had to come in on Wednesday before because the governor called and said we're about to experience one of the worst uh, disasters here in the state. By the way, when I decided to take the job, I said, I'm a little lighter on the environmental health side than I am on the public health side. He goes, oh, you'll have plenty of time. You can get up to speed, whatever. And like, yeah. So I walked into a room, what, twice the size of this with 150 people, and I just remember saying, don't let me get in your way. Don't let me mess you up. <laughs> Tell me how I can help you. And then I got sent out to Sterling because they're um, – water treatment facility got over, um, overrun uh, by the, the head gate, got overrun by the floodwaters. And so my very first duty as uh, chief medical officer of the state, and I did say the word duty, uh, was a no flush order for the entire community. <laughs> but, you know, um, this is like emerging issues. Zika virus, you know, uh, again, uh, Lark or IDs when the Animus River turned orange, you know, how much of that really was an acute environmental health issue and or public health issue versus uh, an opportunity to highlight a, a chronic issue as it relates to who pays for cleanup when it comes to these abandoned mines and um, what is the true sort of toxicity here. Uh, and, and then evaluating different levels. You know, the, the thing about environmental health, especially water, is, you know, what, what are the discharge purposes? Is it for recreational use? Are these folks just fine? you know, from a recreational use standpoint, which is very different than a drinking water source. 
um, which could be different from agricultural use, which could be different from, you know, what's good for the fish or for the microbes or whatever else. So immunizations I mentioned, uh, and then marijuana and oil and gas, we'll just have to uh, let Lisa talk about those at another time. So. Mm -hmm. um, we get asked a lot about uh, since legalization, you know, what have we seen here in Colorado? And everybody throws out numbers. Oh, it's the worst disaster ever. It's great. And, you know, chances are it's somewhere in the middle. So, um, you know, the good news is we haven't seen an increase uh, in youth use since legalization. Um, the lieutenant governor uh, has uh, issued uh, the additional challenge now to say, okay, we haven't seen an increase in use. I want us to show that we're seeing a decrease. Uh, in youth use, uh, because we still have one of the highest youth use rates um, uh, around. Um, we did just get our 2016 BRFAs, uh, which is uh, our adult uh, data, uh, which showed another year of adult use not increasing either. So we've seen neither an increase in adult use nor youth use. So kind of this conversion of I was using illegally before and using legally now but not sort of this inducement. Uh, people are making decisions to use marijuana or marijuana products, uh, I think, independently of uh, kind of its, um, its legal status. One other thing I'll say about youth, just because I'm an adolescent medicine specialist, is um, the one thing we've also seen is that youth have said uh, they have a decreased perception of risk as it relates to marijuana. They view marijuana as less risky than they used to. And, um, that, that might not be a bad thing. Uh, some people are worried that that means, well, it's normalizing, and so maybe more youth will use over time as that perception continues to drop. But if you think about adolescents and adolescent risk behavior, they engage quite a bit in risk behavior because they perceive it as risky. They drive fast, they have unprotected sex, they drink, they do other kinds of drugs or these drugs or whatever. So um, it's possible this may just be blah for them. Um, and we just don't know yet. We don't have enough time yet. But, you know, I'm, I'm not so pessimistic about the fact that they, you know, perceive uh, lower risk uh, than, than they used to. Um, we talked about air, and I asked my test questions. Um, you know, I think um, one of the things I've been trying to push to, and I think you all can help, is as we relate to the healthcare system, we should be trying to integrate public or population health with healthcare delivery so that when patients come in, and I still see patients on Wednesday afternoons when I'm in town, you know, it's not so much just the stethoscope and the tools of the trade and, and, and take the history. You know, uh, I think we can be more effective on the healthcare side if we incorporate more of the population and public health sort of priorities and principles. For example, making sure everybody's enrolled in some sort of um, insurance, making sure we're electronically connected. There's so many doctors that are still sort of fighting this need to um, you know, get um, electronic uh, health records in their office. Integration of behavioral health. LARC, one of the greatest uh, impediments to seeing the expansion of long-acting reversible contraception is many providers, many healthcare providers, just don't want to take the time to be trained, uh, it's more cost effective for me as a doctor to just write a prescription and send you on your way for birth control pills rather than to take the time to get trained and actually go ahead uh, and, and schedule you for a follow-up to go ahead and do, you know, an implant. And so, you know, working on issues uh, around that, I think, obviously, um, will help that program continue. Immunizations, educating on population health issues, addressing social determinants of health, Modeling realistic, healthy eating and active living. You know, again, like we're doing with hospitals and with other institutions, I think people look to us, so we just need to make sure that you know, we set the good example. Um, Take Med Seriously is the name of the campaign as it relates to the prescription opiate um, issue. And then again, being advocates out in the community. Our Healthy Kids Colorado survey, which is the single greatest source of data we use to assess what's going on with our kids, uh, was at risk of being cut because uh, there was a movement that said, hey, we're invading kids' privacy, we're not asking parents' permission, and we're asking very probing questions. Even though anybody can opt out, a parent can opt their kid out, a kid can opt out, a teacher can opt out, a school, all along the way, 
So, you know, making sure you're acting as an advocate for good, sound tools that are very important to us uh, is, is incredibly important. So uh, I saved the last 30 seconds to talk about the federal challenges. Um, <laughs> um, the good news and the bad news is, you know, we don't, um, uh, we don't know where this is going yet. So the longer it sort of sits in limbo, we, we did start, um, as you all know, with October 1st, a new federal fiscal year. Um, we haven't seen any significant or dramatic changes um, to our budget um, at this point from those federal sources, both on the environmental side as well as on the public health side. There are certainly still some things that are on the chopping block, and we have this extension till December. So then in December, we'll kind of go through all of this all over again. Uh, we've been very strong advocates to say it's one thing to talk about insurance and Obamacare and the ACA, but none of that's going to be worth anything if we don't get some focus and attention on these population health programs and services and priorities that get funded through the CDC to all of us uh, at the state level. So um, it's a little bit of a watch and wait. We have more reliance on Congress um, being our friend than we do on the administration itself. And so uh, we'll just uh, kind of make sure we keep everybody posted. But mm -hmm. thus far, no significant changes as of yet. So with that, any questions? <clears throat> None? Okay, thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs>
is it a substitute? You know, now I'm, I can gain access to marijuana, so I'm not drinking alcohol, or I've thrown away the Vicodin, or I'm not using heroin, or, or whatever. So there's a number of studies that are being conducted right now that are, that are looking at that. And I would just caution everybody that that's probably still a year or two away. So every now and again, you'll see somebody sort of blurp up with something that says, oh, states that have legalized marijuana have the highest death rate from heroin, you know, of any, you know, and, and they're not very good studies and, and they're not very well designed. And so um, these are the prospective studies that are going to take another year or two. But I like your idea. I haven't heard of it. Yes, sir. Do you see any unique challenges or opportunities from a public health perspective um, as it pertains to the huge population boom in Colorado? We hear this a lot, people coming in by the thousands every day. Um, so maybe unique um, challenges or opportunities. <coughs> so challenge-wise, and I, thank you for bringing that up because I failed to mention that part of the obesity challenge for us on the adult side is as we look at it, it appears that our increased rate of obesity is as a result of the migration of folks from other states who are more obese and kind of messing with our numbers. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, um, so I mean, so, so that's a big challenge. I mean, I think um, infrastructure uh, is a big challenge for us on the environmental side. We're, we're seeing um, the growth outpiece uh, a lot of the infrastructure as it relates to drinking water systems um, and sanitation systems, and I think that's that's only going to continue to get worse. Um, I mean, those are those are kind of the three right off the top of my head. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, yes, ma'am. You mentioned PDMPs. Yeah. Do Twenty-five states require checking a PDMP before yeah. actually prescribing an opiate. Yeah. What would you think about making Colorado have? Uh, I'm I'm a fan of it, but that makes me really unpopular with the medical society. Um, Sorry, because, can you repeat that? Oh yeah. So uh, the prescription drug monitoring program. Um, so everybody familiar with the PDMP? Ish. Okay. So it's it's basically an online system that you can check to see if a patient has been prescribed um, opiates. Um, but it's also a system where you have to go in, and if you prescribe opiates, you have to sort of enter it. So it's, it's like the immunization system, but for opiates. Um, that's <laughs> terrible. But so anyway. the data is actually <laughs> uploaded by pharmacies. The right. prescribers don't have to upload the data. They can just check the data. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, yes, that is, a, that is a good clarification, because as a prescriber, I don't have to upload the information. It's the pharmacy that actually uploads the information. Um, so we have, in Colorado, mandatory registration for PDMPs. So as a doctor, I had to um, um, register for the PDMP. But there's no mandatory use standard. And so many of these other states uh, have mandatory utilization of the PDMP. Um, and um, uh, our medical society wasn't quite yet ready um, for that, even though the lieutenant governor had actually helped support a bill that was proposed last session that got shot down. Um, but uh, if you look at the data, you, you see that these states that do have the mandatory use piece um, do have a little bit better control. We, we are seeing a decrease um, in prescribing here in Colorado. Um, and so uh, we're also seeing um, insurers like Medicaid and even some of the commercial insurers uh, and some of the pharmacies themselves limiting prescriptions now to seven pills. So that's a, a big help. The other thing you'll see is instead of by pill, they'll do it by equivalence of morphine, which is a little bit more complicated. Um, but I think just starting with the seven pill limit is a, is a really good first step because as we all know, when we get prescriptions filled, the sort of standard is I want my 30 days because that's what my copay pays for. And physicians just sort of, you know, we're, we're kind of inherently trained to just write for 30. And you might need one or two pills for a dental procedure. And um, then you have 28 sitting on the shelf just asking for trouble. So long-winded explanation and filling in the details. But, yeah, I, I'm supportive of mandatory use. This is awesome. I want to thank you for your leadership, that you're willing to come on campus and share. What can we be better doing 
on campus to help better contribute to Colorado's health? Uh, on campus? Well, if you think of us as a collective <laughs> academic community, how yeah. can we be better partners with practice, practice sites? Yeah, I mean, I go back to the advocacy piece. I mean, um, the, the anti-science folk uh, tend to be small but mighty. Uh, and often uh, will get legislators' ears or come down to the Capitol uh, and um, make it seem like they represent everyone. And so, uh, and, and we, myself included, uh, are viewed as um, you know political appointees, so I obviously have a political agenda. Uh, and so having scientists come from you know, an institution like this to be available uh, to help um, advocate for science, I think is the single most important thing. I'm, I'm always, I should, disappointed is probably a little bit of a strong word, but I'm always surprised that somebody out there isn't doing a better job of organizing the scientists and the advocates when, when some of these issues um, you know, are coming up in, in this public forum. So. Well, I know that we have a potential donor that's very interested in exactly that with the school, and so nice. maybe we will be better able to organize. Who that. is it? So. <laughs> <laughs> I can't share, but I do know our new dean is very interested in this as well. So maybe that, Great. maybe with this momentum, we can do a better right, job. I think it'd be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Thank Lisa. You. Thanks, everybody. For